Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our sermon series, that we've been working our way through here, focusing on our baptismal identity, the, the something that God has made us to be through holy baptism, we've reached kind of a, a critical point here, the, the beating heart of our baptismal identity, the very core of what it means to be baptized. We've reached Romans chapter 8, and in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes that by virtue of our baptism into Jesus, we are children of God. I'm going to reread for you now just a few verses from our epistle reading today. It was already short as it is, but I just selected out a few verses. And as I do, I want you to listen for this, the language that describes us as children, sons or daughters. Paul just talks about sons most of the time, but it's not because he doesn't care about the daughters too. It's just back in Paul's day, you could say sons and the, and the, and the daughters were automatically included as well. But listen for that language that describes us as sons or daughters, children of God. St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You hear that language there describing us as sons and daughters, children of God. Paul says it kind of repeatedly there in just a few verses. We who have been baptized into Jesus, he says, are sons and daughters, children of God. In that truth right there, there's enough to unpack that we could take a, a few sermons to wrap our heads around all of that. But I think Paul is pushing us here to see just a little bit more. He's pushing us to see one of the implications of the fact that we are children, sons and daughters of God. He's pushing us to see that that also means that we are brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that might sound strange at first. We're used to thinking about ourselves as children of God. We talk like that all the time. That's familiar language. And we talk sometimes, too, about how we are all brothers and sisters in Christ because we are all baptized into Jesus. You and I, we are brothers and sisters. We're used to thinking that way. But Paul's pushing us further here to see that we are also brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, which if you really think about it, is a rather shocking thing. I heard a pastor start his sermon that way one time. He said he started his sermon by saying, dear brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I have no idea what he said for the rest of the sermon. Because for the rest of it, I was trying to figure out, wrap my head around the idea that I am a brother of Jesus and Jesus is my brother. But if we are children of God, which Paul says that we are, then it stands to reason that we are brothers or sisters of Jesus who is the Son of God. And Paul says as much just a little bit later in the book, uh, in, in the chapter 8 of his letter to the Romans. After our reading today, a little later on in the chapter, Paul expands on what he said here, and he says that God has chosen us. God has chosen you. God has chosen me from before the foundation of the world, from before the world was made. God chose you. God chose me. And through holy baptism here in time, 
God has made you his child. And Paul says the reason that God has done that is so that our Lord Jesus, and this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that our Lord Jesus would be the firstborn, the older brother of many brothers and sisters, of you and of me. And so we are children of God and brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus. Now to help us kind of unpack what that means to be a brother or sister of our Lord Jesus, I want to turn our attention to a different place in the scriptures for a little while here. We'll come back to the epistle reading in a bit. But I want to turn our attention to Luke chapter 15, where we find Jesus telling a very famous parable, not the parable we had in our gospel reading today, but another famous one, the parable of the prodigal son. And that's the place to look if you want to figure out the family dynamics of the family of God. It's where you find it. One of the interesting things about the parable of the prodigal son, however, is that at first glance, anyways, there doesn't seem to be any character in the parable of the prodigal son who represents Jesus. Think about it. The main characters that we normally think of in the parable of the prodigal son are the prodigal son and the father. The prodigal son is the son who asks for his share of the father's inheritance, which is essentially going to his dad and asking, Dad, I wish you were dead. Please give me the money that is owed to me. When you do die, I'm going to go. And he takes the money, he goes, and he squanders it on wild living in some far-off country until he comes to his senses and drags himself back home again and returns to his father's house. That prodigal son, in the story, he represents you and he represents me. Sinners, prodigal children of God, who by nature, from birth, have been wandering from the loving care of our Heavenly Father, seeking to live our own way and to make use of our own resources and all our own stuff to live how we want to live. He represents us. The Father in the story is the one who graciously and lovingly receives his prodigal son back into his home. And when he sees that son coming, in fact, throws a party, has the servants slaughter the fattened calf, and celebrates the fact that this, his son, who was lost, has now come home. He represents God the Father, who, like the Father in the story, has welcomed us, his prodigal children, home as his beloved children. We know from the rest of the scriptures, that it's Jesus who makes all of that happen, right? Jesus is the cog in the middle there. And it's by his death on the cross and his rising from the dead that this, this reconciliation, this restoration in the family of God has taken place. We know that from the rest of the Bible. But in the parable, there's nothing really about that. Jesus is, in fact, kind of strangely absent I'm quite certain, however, that that was no accident. Jesus didn't forget to put himself in the story. He did it entirely on purpose. Because rather than including in the parable of the prodigal son a character who represents himself, Jesus actually includes a character in the parable of the prodigal son who actually represents the exact opposite of himself. The third, sometimes forgotten, character in the parable of the prodigal son is the older brother, the prodigal son's older brother, the older son of the father. This older brother, he doesn't come into the parable all that much until after the prodigal son has come home and been welcomed home by his father. The older brother, he's out in the field when all that happens, when his brother kind of comes dragging back, and he's out in the field still when the welcome home party gets underway. And at first, he doesn't understand what all the excitement, all the hoopla here is about. But when he hears that this party, this celebration, is taking place on account of his good-for-nothing, deadbeat, screw-up of a brother coming home, <laughs> 
The older brother is furious. Now, it would be easy for us to heap scorn all over this, this older brother and marvel at his selfishness, his, his lovelessness. But when we actually stop and think a little bit harder and look a little bit closer, I think we can see that he's actually a rather relatable kind of character. I grew up in a family with three siblings. There's four of us kids. And most of the time, I think, this is according to my recollection. My mother's here this morning, so we'll see what she says. Most of the time, I think, I was willing to share most of what I had with most of them. Most of the time. But all it took was one of them doing something I didn't like, one of them saying something, that I didn't like, one of them doing something that upset or offended me in any way, shape, or form, and all of a sudden that willingness to share, which was there before, would be gone in an instant. And I know it's not just me, because it happens with my kids too. One moment everything's fine, and they're sharing and getting along just fine, then somebody says something, and that toy's mine. That toy's mine, and off they go to their separate rooms to go do their own thing. That's how it is for all of us, I think. And it's how it was for the older brother in this story, too. Why, after all, would he want to share anything with this brother who had hurt his father and their whole family so terribly? After all, the younger brother had already gotten his share of the inheritance. And that means that everything that was left, everything that the father still had, actually really would ultimately belong to that older brother. And so when that older brother sees his younger brother welcomed home and this party being thrown to welcome him home, all that older brother sees is that stuff that rightly belongs to him. The stuff that is truly his <coughs> being given to that good-for-nothing screw-up of a brother who had treated the rest of the family so terribly. I think we can sympathize a little bit. But that is where Jesus comes in to the parable of the prodigal son. Not because Jesus is like that. Quite the opposite. But because Jesus, our older brother, is the exact opposite of that. The older son in the parable, you could almost say, is kind of like an anti-Jesus. Not the anti-Christ, that's a different thing. The anti-Jesus, the opposite of Jesus. Jesus is nothing like that older son. Jesus, our older brother, the perfectly holy, righteous son of God who is without sin and is perfectly obedient to God the Father in every way, does not, even though he would have every right to do so, does not stand out in the field grumbling and complaining as he sees God the Father pour out the riches of his grace on prodigal sinners such as us. But instead, Jesus our older brother delights, rejoices in sharing everything that rightfully belongs to himself, everything that he is and has. He delights to share with you, his brother or his sister. If we walk, we can come back to Romans chapter 8 now. If we walk through this reading here, well, to see some of the things that Jesus, our older brother, shares with us. Paul says here, he says, We have received the spirit of adoption as sons or daughters. The spirit of adoption, the spirit of being part of the family. The question we need to ask is, from whom did we receive that spirit? Spirit. 
the spirit that makes us part of the family? The answer is from Jesus. In the Gospel of John, when John is telling us the story of Jesus' death on the cross, in particular, those last moments as he gives up his life, John says something like this. This is how our English Bibles usually put it anyways. It says, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And to that we're led to believe is you know, his death. It's true, it is his death, and it's a fine translation, there's nothing really wrong with it. But if you look to what the words there actually mean, there's more going on than simply just Jesus just giving up his life. The word that we have translated in our English Bibles there is gave up, can actually mean something more like handed over. So it says he bowed his head, head and he handed over his spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Son of God, handed over to you and to me from the cross. That happened in the miraculous kind of way at Pentecost, when it comes down from heaven, tongues of fire, all of that. But the root is there at the cross. As Jesus, as he has finished paying for your sins, my sins, the sins of the entire world, hands over now his Spirit so that everyone who believes and is baptized can be the Son of God a daughter of God, a child of God. And this spirit, Paul says, that has been handed over to us by Jesus, the Son of God, causes us to be able to cry out, he says, to cry out to God and say, Abba, which is the Aramaic word for father, Abba, or in English, father. Jesus is the one who rightly calls God his Father, who has every right to pray and to call on God that way. You and I, prodigal children as we are, we have no more right than the prodigal son did to call his father his father anymore. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Neither are we. And yet when Jesus, our older brother, who gave his life for ours and handed over his spirit to us, when he taught his disciples to pray, and when he teaches you and me to pray, he looks at us and he says, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. The prayer that belongs to Jesus. That's why we call it the Lord's Prayer belongs to Jesus, he gives to you. He shares with you so that you can call upon his father just as he calls upon his father. And that's not all. Jesus just keeps sharing and Paul just keeps outlining it here. Paul goes on in our reading today and says, the spirit, again, this same spirit of adoption as sons and daughters of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs, co-heirs with Christ. The inheritance of eternal life and a place in the Father's house rightly belongs to only one person. To Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And yet Jesus, our older brother, he doesn't stand out there in the field... He doesn't grumble and complain about us having returned home or expecting to have some place in the Father's house. No. Jesus, our older brother, says to us in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus, our brother, delights even to share his inheritance, his place in the Father's house with you and with me. So we can call ourselves sons and daughters of God. So we can call upon God as our Father in prayer, 
and we can look forward to this inheritance, the inheritance of Jesus himself, as he shares it with you and with me. We're going to unpack that inheritance a little more next week when we talk about life as children of God in the new creation. But for today, we just rejoice that we have an older brother who shares so abundantly and so lovingly with children of God like us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life that is everlasting. Amen.